topographic maps. As we previously discussed, from space, Earth appears smooth and flat. But on the surface, things look a lot different, and the surface has different elevations and features like mountains, plateaus, and plains. We call these geographic features landscapes, and landscapes can be shown on maps in a few different ways. When comparing landscapes to one another, it's their elevation that sets them apart. Elevation measures the vertical distance of the surface above or below sea level. A relief map shows different elevations using color codes, and these color codes are correlated with different landscapes. The United States is comprised of all three types of landscape, with mountainous areas to the west and east and flat plains in the center. Although this is not a relief map, this is page two of your Earth Science Reference Table. This is a landscape map of New York State. This map displays the different kinds of landscapes across the state as well as the borders between these features. This map is often referenced with page 3, which also shows New York State cities and the types of landscapes associated with those cities. A question you could be asked would be, what is the type of landscape associated with Elmira, New York? Well, you would need to use the map on page 3 to locate Elmira. And Elmira is located using this map here. And if I go back to my other map and keep that same location, Elmira is in the landscape known as the Allegheny Plateau. So that's one way that you can use page two and three together to figure out any of the landscape features of the New York State cities. But that's really not what this video is about. Bear Mountain is a state park located north of New York City in the Hudson Highlands. And Bear Mountain State Park has a lot to offer, such as biking, boating, picnicking, swimming, sledding, ice skating. There's even a zoo and a carousel. But what most people travel to Bear Mountain for is either hiking or biking. And there's a number of different trails that run through the state park. A useful tool to navigate the terrain of the area is a trail map. This is a trail map of Bear Mountain showing the trail path in red and other prominent landmarks in the area. The map provides a scale in the lower right hand corner as well as contour lines. We had talked about contour lines when we first mentioned ISO lines as lines that show elevation and as with all field maps, these lines connect areas of equal elevation. For example, this line is equivalent to 1100 feet above sea level. And the benefit of using a map like this is knowing where there's more difficult terrain and what may be inaccessible as a result. Uh, the trail is already laid out for a hiker or a biker on this map, but if it wasn't, uh, a good map reader could use this map to navigate um, the area and find where the elevation of the terrain changes too quickly. Um, we talked about this, where lines are close together, the elevation is going to change very fast over a very short distance. This would make hiking or biking in that area very difficult. And where lines are more spread apart, the effort needed to move over that type of terrain would be much less. So a topographic map is very helpful in communicating that type of information. So our job is to learn how to read topographic maps, but also create them. And let's take a look at a couple of examples. So, so here's a, a topographic map. Uh, the map scale is given uh, along the bottom along with the contour interval. And the contour interval here shows uh, an increase or decrease in elevation for each line. According to the contour interval here, the, each line is incrementally different by 20 feet. 
Now, contour lines are not evenly spaced from one another, so knowing the contour interval can help fill in the lines not showing. So in this map, we are given an index contour. That's the 500. So that value is an index. Uh, and if I asked you what's the value of the other lines using the contour interval and the index contour, they would be, so these lines would be equivalent to 520, 540, 560, and 580, because we're increasing by 20 feet, showing different elevations as I move up the map. Here's a more complicated map, but let's try to apply the same thinking and try to calculate the elevation at point Y. Just make a note that the contour interval here is different. It's 50 meters, so different maps are going to have different contour intervals. So what would be the elevation at Y? If I'm using my index contour, which is 500, then I would go up by 50, so 500, 550, 600. So since Y is actually sitting on that line, it has a value equal to 600 meters above sea level. Once again, as we learned with isolines and field maps, an isoline always connects points of equal value, and anywhere on this line, the value would be equal to the specified value. So in other words, if I were to trace around this line, these are all values of 600 meters above sea level. And keep in mind that these lines do not exist in real life, and they're really here to help the reader visualize the pattern in the field data. All right, let's go with a more complicated question. Now, I'm asking, what is the elevation of point A? Notice that point A doesn't exist on one of the contour lines. We're going to apply the same thinking as before. We're going to use that index contour nearby, which is 500, and the contour interval hasn't changed, which is 50 meters. So if we follow the pattern, um, this line is going to be equal to 550. This line would be equal to 600. And the following line is going to be equal to 650. Now, I could easily say, well, A is equal to 650, but that would not be correct because it's not actually on that, per that pink line that I just drew. It's inside of it. So I know that it has to be a value greater than 650 because it's inside of that last ISO line. But I also know that there's not another line drawn here. There's no 700 ISO line. So an acceptable answer for this question would be any value between 651 and 699 meters. Because I know that it's got to be greater than the ISO line that I just crossed, which is 650. But it can't be more than what the next ISO line would be, which is 700, because I'm going up by 50s. Hopefully that's not too complicated, but as we always do, we'll have to practice more in class. Let's just move over to the other piece of information that we can get from field maps. And that's the best way to communicate any pattern that the data is showing by looking at what's called the gradient. Now you can find the formula for gradient on page one of your earth science reference table. It's equal to the change in field value over a distance. Before we actually get into the numerical conversion of gradient, let's just talk about um, how we can find it on a map easily and can kind of make an estimation. Think of gradient as being rate of change. Uh, we mentioned this already, the closer the isolines, the faster the change in data and the larger the gradient will be. And the opposite is true. When contour lines are far apart, that means that the rate of change is much slower and the gradient's going to be lower as well. So if I were to look at this map carefully and look for any areas where the lines were close together, like right here, based on the fact that the lines are close together, I know that the elevation is changing very quickly over a very short distance as compared to somewhere over here. slope. Another example, trying to pick out where the lines are closest together. That's probably somewhere around here. That's where my steep slope is. There's a couple of places I could have chose now for the flatter slope, but this looks like the area where the lines are the furthest apart. 
All right, so let's talk about numerically calculating the slope. And to do this, we actually need to do some measuring. We need to measure the distance between two points as well as find the difference in their elevation. So I'm going to use location C and D. And location C to D, there's a line already drawn for us. So what we need to do first is figure out, okay, what's the elevation at C? What's the elevation at D? At C, the elevation is 1,500 feet. It's right on that line. That index contour is already drawn for us. And at D, it's 1,000 feet. Now I need to know how far apart are these two points. To do that, I need the map scale. Map scales are typically on the bottom of the page. And to use it effectively, I like to use a scrap piece of paper and mark off the differences between uh, the increments. So in this case, each mile, I'm going to draw a line on my scrap piece of paper. Then I'm going to take my scrap piece of paper and hold it up to my line between C and D and calculate how many miles exist between C and D. According to the scale on the map, that's a total of two miles. You can also do this with a ruler, but I find it's a lot easier to use scrap paper because you can copy the scale exactly. Just have to be very careful and um, accurate. So we have a distance of two miles. So if I want to numerically calculate the gradient from C to D, this is what I would need to do. I would use the change in field value, in this case change in elevation, which was 1,500 feet minus 1,000 feet, and put that over two miles. Just like rate of change, I'd simplify. So now I have 500 feet over two miles, and I'd have to do some math using a calculator. And I would get a gradient equivalent to 200 feet per mile. Units, of course, very important. And that's telling me that over the distance from C to D, I'm increasing or decreasing, depending on which direction you're going, um, by a total of 200, 250 feet for every mile that I cross. And that's how you calculate gradient using a numerical value. So we'll practice more in class, but that's all for now. Thanks for watching.